When I consider what you mean to me, it is a fact I've come to realize that you're my closest link to paradise, despite what wise men try to make us see. They caution us against idolatry and tell us that we should not jeopardize immortal life for anything that dies and not to be bemused by mere beauty. It seems ungracious not to take delight in day because it turns so soon to night. Eternity is always here to stay. It's only you and I who fade away. You are my here and now, my present tense. I hope you will excuse my diffidence. Love does not always find a way, but gives a promise that it cannot be destroyed. It's even killed and buried, and yet it lives in every heart in which it's crucified. Love is sheer joy, but has to suffer you and me. It can't avoid its calvary. Silent, unseen, transparent, pure and true, rich in its own reward of poverty. When we can find no one to whom to turn, or nothing but an it, can we rely to consume us, or else we can but burn in just the fire we persecute it by. Love cannot help but always wish all well. To deny it is the essence of pure hell. If I could turn you on, if I could drive you out of your wretched mind, if I could tell you, I would let you know. These words were written by Dr. R. D. Lang, one of the foremost psychiatrists of our time. Born in Glasgow, Scotland in 1927, Lang was drawn at an early age to the misery and suffering he saw around him. Until his death in 1989, he devoted his life to the study of the human condition redefining our concepts of madness and offering revolutionary humanistic solutions to the problems of mental illness. For Lang, modern society imposes prison walls of conformity on the individual, inhibiting potential and devastating the personality. So-called madness may be the result of a person's inability to suppress his normal instincts to conform to an abnormal society. In exploring what drives people to madness, Lang was a master at portraying the incompatible contradictions that can enmesh people in a web of lies and collusions. For him, the key to understanding was always personal experience. Well, I used to practice going crazy. Uh, I, I, I used to practice uh, as a sort of mental exercise, putting myself into uh, obsessional states and paranoid states and 
uh, other sorts of states and pull myself out again. Uh, which I, I think is a very good uh, technique uh, to give to people who are going crazy. That if you, uh, uh, one thing you can do, instead of feeling the helpless victim of what is overtaking you, to, uh, to do it yourself uh, and uh, sort of get a sort of control of the movement uh, there. And uh, by exploring how, to, uh, how it comes about that uh, you can get into a state where you feel that uh, everyone is uh, looking at you or you're the centre of the universe, uh, you can release yourself from the, um, the spell <coughs> of that. Um, I, I, I think one of the uh, main reasons why I uh, got into psychiatry was that I felt a, a, a companionship with the crazy people, <coughs> in some ways more than I did with the so-called normal sane people. I wanted to put myself right in where uh, the uh, misery and suffering seemed most intense. Uh, and that uh, led me into the back wards of uh, uh, mental hospitals, uh, where, <laughs> again, it wasn't, um, uh, it, it didn't seem to me that uh, these people, however miserable they were and looked and uh, uh, appeared to other people, did not seem to me essentially more miserable than, uh, than a lot of the jailers who were uh, the nurses and the psychiatrists in charge of them. After studying, uh, doing research on the families of schizophrenics, I, I did uh, uh, research on normal families, and that was the most devastating uh, professional or research scientific experience that I've had in my life. I've never published um, the uh, detailed results or, or d detailed descriptions of that. But, uh, the the so-called normal families that uh, that I studied in the course of uh, this uh, uh, work. Um, it was like walking into uh, carbon monoxide uh, gas chambers. Uh, people uh, adjusted to uh, life and induced their children to uh, uh, adjust to life by poisoning themselves uh, to a level of subsistence existence that they called life. Uh, Nietzsche said, do not be afraid, your soul has died long before you will die. Uh, and uh, that vision, which if, if you go around speaking it uh, without contextualizing it very uh, carefully, like when people go around saying that everyone's dead, everyone's a robot, everyone's a zombie and so on, you're schizophrenic if you say that. But that is a true perception of, uh, uh, well, it's just as true as the, uh, or in, in a sense more true than uh, uh, what is supposed to be the same uh, perception of uh, state of affairs. When Allen Ginsberg writes a poem in, uh, in, in which he uh, says that our only freedom is to be found in the cage that we made for ourselves, he can get away with that because he is a poet and an internationally known figure. But if someone was to say that out of proper framing of it, you'd be in for a lot of trouble. I think people go crazy for all sorts of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons, or one of the factors, uh, that uh, uh, is involved for many people. Not I'm, I want to avoid making sweeping, absolute, inclusive generalizations, but uh, uh, um, one of them is that the, I, I, I think is they run into impossible clashing contradictions uh, that cut right through their whole 
heart and soul and the existence uh, that um, that they can't reconcile. Uh, it's, a, it's as though the elements of their world uh, are incompatible with each other. So, if the if you've got the elements of a system that are incompatible with each other, such that if my left hand exists, my right hand can't, then something has got to give. You're into some sort of self-destruct system. And when that system, that world, which is someone's existence, uh, self-destructs, uh, then you have what is clinically described as um, craziness. Supposing you induce me to believe that I love you, and then you induce me to believe that if I love you, uh, I've got to believe you. So I'm now, I now love you and I believe you. And you now tell me, you don't love me. You don't love anyone. And no one loves you except me. Well, in that case, you know, I've, uh, I believe I love you, I, I believe you, uh, and then you've told me that I don't love you, so I, I, I love you, I don't love you, and then you say, now don't believe me because I say so. Just look into yourself and see for yourself that everything I'm saying is true. Well, I now have got to handle an incompatible set of propositions. Because I'm, I've, I've got to believe that I love you, I've got to believe I don't love you, I've got to believe you, and I've not got to believe you. Because don't believe me, because I say so. It's the only reason that I believe you is because you've, you've said so. So if uh, this was what the... This is not technically exactly what Gregory Bateson, the anthropologist, put out as a double bite, but it's what I've called a knot that you tied in, an incompatible. Um, so what do you, how do you live in an, in an unlivable situation? Uh, and if, if you can't find your way out of that, the only way out of that one, for instance, is to be able to repudiate one of those propositions. So I says, well, I don't love you, and I don't believe you either. The two most horrible things in, uh, uh, in a relationship is, is living with someone who you can see doesn't love you, but who wants you to believe that you do, and... Uh, tries to impose uh, the contract that if you love me, uh, how dare you uh, doubt that I love you? And the second thing is living with someone, is, which is maybe even worse, living with someone that uh, one doesn't love oneself, and uh, uh, has got to pretend, or one feels that one has to pretend that one does. Well, uh, and uh, uh, in many relationships, both of these are happening at the same time. <laughs> uh, well, to use that expression once more, uh, that uh, is a terrible uh, expression, but nevertheless, fuck it. Uh, whether one's only one life or uh, uh, over a uh, hundred thousand, hundred thousand lifetimes in this lifetime, uh, I've made my mind up. I'm not going to spend my time in that sort of uh, 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 misery. You start to hate someone that you have to pretend to.
I mean, you start to hate them all the more, the more you keep on saying I love you when you don't mean it. Well, uh, there's something to do with sheer common sense, that if that penny, penny drops, or that cent drops, or whatever it is, that you, t you take a, either a deep breath or a sigh instead of screaming, and uh, walk in the other direction of that vicious circle. Not doing it, one's not doing the children any good if there are children, because they see through that. Eventually it comes to, who are you kidding? It's living in a lying field. Every liar <coughs> has got to induce other people to believe them. But if you uh, then fall for that one, then the ground, you've taken the ground away from your own feet. As uh, I got into that sort of thing once with uh, a woman that I was living with. Uh, and one epitomizing moment that um, shook me out of it was uh, when we were in the course of uh, uh, what had started to be fre in frequent interminable arguments, uh, she got up and walked out the, the room. Uh, as she was walking out the room, I shouted at her, what do you think you're doing walking out the room when we're in the middle of a conversation? And as she walked out the room, she turned around and said to me, I'm not walking out the room. Well, that returned me to my senses. I, it, it, you, you either have to believe your senses or to believe the other person. If the other person, what the, what, if what the other person is asking you to believe actually contradicts your own senses, then you're at a choice point. You're, uh, you're, uh, you, uh, and uh, you either, it's either got a snap or it's, uh, you fall into an uh, abject sort of hypnotic spell of the other person. Or if you're poised in between, then that is the moment when you're liable to go. <coughs> uh, I mean, the door is open to walk out of it at any time. But, but how do we see that it is? Well, <coughs> uh, 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 there's what Kierkegaard called in the first place a leap of faith, of just taking the risk to go for love and truth. We don't know where it's going to get us, but we take that, throw ourselves into the abyss. Uh, I don't see uh, how we get out of it, and, uh, because we're hallucinating the abyss. We, uh, but the leap of faith is that that abyss is perfect freedom, and uh, that it doesn't lead to our uh, self-annihilation, self-destruction, and uh, all the rest of it, but the exact opposite. If you of the whole world to me, and I lose you to someone else, I lose my whole world. I lose everything. I lose my sense of self. I lose my sense of value. I lose my sense of very existence. I feel dead. I feel empty. I feel forsaken and forlorn. I might even be so disorientated that I, do, I can't even t uh, talk about a, 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 a feeling that is as coherent even as feeling lonely or even abandoned. The loss of the other, when the other has become one's whole world, uh, is the loss of everything. A crisis is a state of dangerous possibility. 
or the prospect of a dangerous possibility can go, the cat can jump one way or the other. A jealousy is the envisaging of, uh, uh, from the point of view of those who have got it all to lose, as a catastrophic possibility generated by the one one loves being lost to one to somebody else. It's not just a matter of loss, it is to somebody else. There's got to be a third party for this loss of another person. It is that he or she is in someone else's arms. Who is kissing her now? Who is buying the wine? Everything I've said so far I regard as perfectly justified and perfectly wholesome and perfectly healthy. I don't think jealousy in every shape and form, as I'm using the word now, is always um, an expression of a, an emotional mental disorder or a spiritual hang-up or lack of uh, uh, enlightenment, self-realization, self-actualization or uh, advancement in the spiritual path. I don't think it um, belongs essentially or necessarily to the zone of immaturity or neuroticism or pathology, but it often does. Uh, there are immature forms of love. There are mature forms of love. There are immature forms of desire. There are mature forms of desire and there are immature forms of jealousy, and there is a mature form of jealousy. It is perfectly justified to be on the alert all the time for people who appear to be friends, who are out to take the one one loves away from one if they can manage it. I'm not saying that yeah, and, uh, 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 and we're not talking about the uh, hallucinating of, of this and the projection of hallucinated internal object onto a third party rightly or wrongly, which is common enough. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the justified uh, 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 sense of uh, potential danger, which is present everywhere, and, where, and uh, the only uh, mitigating factor to that danger is um, the confidence and trust in the love of the other for oneself. Because if the other doesn't love one, then the other is liable to be tugged away if, the, uh, uh, if uh, someone uh, tugs hard enough and convincing enough and uh, uh, charmingly enough and uh, all the rest of it. And that happens all the time. Most people who get divorced, uh, get divorced uh, after or in the course of one party's affection uh, moving to a third party. Either because it has already happened or because it's suspected it's going to happen. In talking with uh, sharing professional uh, uh, experience. People working with uh, couples um, come up with between 60 and 80 percent of the couples that they're, uh, who come to see them. One or other of the member of the couple are having an affair with someone else. And usually they don't think that that's got anything to do with the problem. Uh, and very often, the affair is clandestine, and they don't think that's got anything to do with it either. The person who's handling the clandestine affair, if the other doesn't know what the heart doesn't know, the heart needn't grieve for, and they, they, they think that uh, that's got nothing to do with their relationship, as long as the other person doesn't apparently know that it's going on. I think that's total nonsense. The most obvious type of um, catastrophe uh, or, or sh uh, thing that befalls people that uh, probably happen to 
more than 50% of uh, any group, including this, is uh, when one finds out something um, that has one, one has been seriously deceived about and, and one's been living in a false tapestry, uh, in a false reality, and then discovers that it's been false. That is a major shock, I think, to the system. And I've never seen that really uh, seriously um, addressed. Well, I, I believe that uh, in communicating um, these matters of uh, the heart and of uh, experience, there's a great deal to be said for uh, speaking in terms of stories or narrative or parables. After all, if parables were good enough for Jesus Christ, I feel uh, good enough for me. Uh, I <clears throat> but I have to just uh, say a word about that, perhaps, because I know that um, in this uh, culture that we live in, a lot of people don't take stories seriously um, and feel that uh, a really serious discussion of these matters ought to be discussed discursively. But a story, these stories that are parabolic contain, uh, I think, uh, explosive charges of meaning which uh, irradiate in all directions. On the subject of uh, Eros, love and lies, I don't think that uh, Eros has got in itself very much to do with love in the sense that we usually use uh, love as having something to do with uh, uh, benevolent, uh, compassionate concern for the fate of uh, other people. When Eros comes in the door, very often love flies out the window. Uh, bedrooms are among the most dangerous places on earth. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, I believe it's actually the case that in this country more crimes of violence uh, occur in bedrooms than, uh, than in any other location. Uh, if Eros hasn't got very much to do uh, in itself very often with love, I don't think it has got very much to do with truth either. Uh, certainly traditionally it has never, uh, never has had. Um, as far as truth goes, uh, it's a pity, I think, that truth uh, is a noun. I would like to have a verb, an active verb, uh, that corresponds to that noun. In Old English, we might say to troth. We could say that to troth and to love are certainly very, very close. And for that matter, in our um, contemporary world, I don't think Eros has got very much to do with sex either. And the descriptions uh, in, um, that I have been reading uh, from uh, American textbooks of uh, sexology uh, 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 I don't, I, I'm not quite sure what is going on in this, uh, uh, supposed to be going on in, uh, among large sectors of the population in this country. And, uh, I, I remember reading uh, when the Kinsey Report, the first Kinsey Report came out uh, what, over th well over 30, year, 30 years ago, uh, that the average time that an American man kept his penis in uh, an American woman's vagina uh, between putting it in, uh, coming and taking it out, 
was two and a half minutes, which I thought was <laughs> a very long time indeed. <laughs> Two and a half minutes. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, 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 here is a, uh, a, a description for um, uh, college students from a textbook that uh, um, uh, comes from Stanford University, Berkeley, on uh, fundamentals of human sexuality. It's used as a, a teaching. Um, Manual and has been a book club collection, uh, a, 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 a book club uh, selection, sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, it gives a description of what is called an orgasm, uh, which is a case in point to me that I, I, I doubt whether in uh, large sectors of uh, our society eros uh, has got very much to do with sex, let alone love or truth. This is a, this is a contemporary orgasm. Um, <laughs> in intense orgasm, the whole body becomes rigid the abdomen becomes hard and spastic, the stiffened neck is thrust forward, the shoulders and arms are rigid and grasping, the eyes bulge <laughs> and stare vacantly <laughs> or are shut tightly, the whole body convulses in synchrony with the genital throbs or twitches uncontrollably. And if you don't uh, imbibe this uh, data, you're not going to pass your examinations uh, <laughs> in Stanford uh, University. Well, <sighs> Eros is uh, Well, it's been said that, sec uh, that, that life is a sexually transmitted disease <laughs> with 100% <laughs> mortality. If the erotic affliction occurs in a flash, uh, love, as I'm using the uh, term, is a long and arduous uh, practice uh, and art. I don't think that love uh, comes to us just like that. And a lot of people, uh, I think, um, suffer a great deal of um, disillusionment and disappointment because when they fall in love, uh, which one does, uh, that the mistake that falling in love for the long haul, uh, long struggle to perhaps come to be able to love. From what I've uh, been told, uh, gleaned in this respect, I've come to uh, feel that to a great extent, the sexual life of uh, the present day couldn't be conducted without a great deal of lies, deception, at least of uh, secrecy. And per, uh, uh, that is be, there's nothing new in that, but uh, uh, if anything like a sexual revolution has occurred, it certainly hasn't cut out that sort of thing. In West Germany, after a, a very thoughtful uh, discussion uh, uh, about this uh, among a, a group of uh, people, one uh, woman who's uh, about 50 years old uh, uh, took me into her confidence uh, and it, uh, told me the following story that made me think 
uh, how often does this sort of thing go on that we never know and how, uh, how much does what one know might, uh, what one not know uh, if one doesn't allow for the fact that one doesn't know, uh, could affect one's, uh, professionally and personally, one's whole sense of reality as to what the fabric of uh, life is actually, uh, is actually to uh, many people. This woman was a very successful and competent uh, businesswoman. She had, uh, uh, she was now living with her third husband when she was uh, 11 years old, her father died. And her uh, mother, after a year, developed a relationship with a, a man who she subsequently married when she was about 14. About the time that uh, her mother and uh, this man got married, she and uh, the man uh, developed a sexual liaison, a full sexual liaison. She had been pre-pubertal by that time and her mother's marriage coincided with her uh, reaching puberty. <clears throat> and that went on for about three years and then when sh uh, she was uh, 19, she herself uh, became engaged and got married. And about the time that uh, she uh, got married, she resumed this uh, sexual liaison with her stepfather and got pregnant. This sexual liaison with her stepfather went on off and on on the side. For several years she got pregnant again. She subsequently got divorced from her first husband uh, and uh, subsequently got married again. Uh, to this day, <coughs> uh, her first husband uh, uh, completely believes and assumes that these two children are, her, uh, are his and both the children believe that uh, her first husband is their father. And um, she has never, she said, told anyone about this except me. I want to uh, concentrate here just for a few minutes on uh, the possible uh, effects of on uh, the person or the people who are not telling lies or being a living lie, but the effects on the person or persons who are living in a lie, who are living in a falsified field, like, say, the two children of this uh, woman who uh, uh, take uh, her first husband to be their father and he who takes them to be his children, but they aren't. Uh, does that affect them in some way that uh, uh, no one knows? Uh, I've had, I've been consulted several times by, uh, uh, and one time in particular that uh, 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 for some reason is particularly clear in my memory, uh, of a woman who had a, a son of 14 who was about to be admitted to hospital for electric shocks, diagnosed as schizophrenic, uh, his main symptom was that he had developed a delusion that his father wasn't his father. And of course, she said, well, the fact of the matter is that he isn't. <laughs> but how could she tell him that? No, how could she tell her husband that? She said it would break his heart and uh, 
uh, if the boy was schizophrenic anyway, I mean, uh, that's a genetic constitutional disease uh, uh, or biologically determined, would it, make, would it might just upset him all the more if he was told. Uh, in this instance, so I, I put it to her, well, you'll have it on your uh, mind for the rest of your life that you've sacrificed your uh, son, whether you know or uh, can be sure that or not, in order to keep this uh, secret. Uh, on the other hand, if you tell your husband and if you tell your uh, uh, son, uh, I can't, uh, obviously, and neither can you, uh, know what will happen. And in, th in this case, he actually did. And uh, overnight, the whole symptomatology, so-called, of the boy evaporated. That was the end of the so-called schizophrenia in this instance. And as it happened, it's almost too good to be true. The husband was very upset, <coughs> but he got over it, and they went off together eventually for a second honeymoon and uh, made it all up, but it doesn't necessarily have a happy ending like that every time. A man uh, was um, on a train. Uh, a few minutes before he had to get out at his stop, he looked up and caught the eyes in full eye contact with a woman sitting opposite him in the train. And without a word being spoken, something happened at that very moment between them. And they, without any negotiation or conversation or anything, uh, as he had to get out at the next stop, uh, exchanged telephone numbers with a view to phoning each other up. Subsequently, uh, he got out at that stop and um, uh, the next day he got a, a call from the woman to, and they fixed up to meet somewhere. Before the conversation with her was over, however, she said, isn't it very, uh, I must tell you this, uh, how strange it uh, was. You know, just at that very moment that our eyes met in the train, and they knew the, uh, the time to, it was 3.32 in the afternoon because uh, he had to get off at the next stop and knew exactly the time that the train had uh, got and knew it to the minute uh, that moment. She said, isn't it strange uh, that at that very, uh, uh, just at that time, my husband had a heart attack and it has been rushed to hospital where he now is. I've known people that I think have died of a transpersonal heart attack or have uh, had a, a cardiac arrest. Or there's, uh, there's one uh, woman that uh, uh, on discovery of her uh, husband's uh, carrying on, uh, at the very moment that she discovered it on the telephone from so, uh, someone else, she appeared to go into an acute hemolytic crisis where uh, 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 over 70% of her red blood cells uh, were wiped out in a few uh, minutes, uh, and so on and so forth. I think there are consequences that, uh, to, uh, I, I think it's very perilous actually to life, to health and so on, this field of lies that we all live in somewhere and some people, some children are completely enveloped in it all their lives. Uh, the reason why I'm bringing out these things is that I do believe 
that there is a decent way to live and that we all have access to it, even though, we can, or even though sometimes we can put ourselves into a false position that might be extremely difficult to get out of. Uh, I do think that the, there, is, that there is a correct way to live, that the way to live is trothfully and in the light of love. Uh, and although it may sound uh, a bit uh, yuppie, um, if that if it sounds uh, uh, like that, I'm going to. Uh, it was a hard won statement from Saint Catherine of Siena. Uh, which goes like this, and with the Salen. She said, all the way to heaven is heaven. For have I not, for has he not said, I am the way. All the way to heaven is heaven. For has he not said, I am the way the truth and the life and love are one. Thank you.